Good afternoon, everybody. You're welcome to this webinar uh, with David Hennig, uh, who is in the European Centre for International Political Economy, uh, and where he looks after the UK Trade Policy Project in that institute. Uh, my name is Dahi Otali. I'm the uh, chairman of the UK group in the Institute for International uh, and European Affairs, and it's a pleasure to welcome what I believe is a very large audience uh, to this webinar. Uh, David Hennig has a, a very distinguished career. He spent time in a private consultancy before joining the UK government, where he did a great deal of work on trade. And, but he resigned, or retired from the UK government a few years ago, and now works for the European Centre for International Political Economy. David, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. The floor is yours for about 20, 25 minutes, uh, and then we take questions and answers uh, from, the, from the audience. And everything is on the record. David, you're welcome. Thank you for that uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting those, uh, those questions. Please note that uh, easy questions are preferred. Um, <laughs> Thank you for the invite to talk about UK trade policy. I mean, I look on uh, with admiration at the quality of the speakers you've you've had in, in recent months, and I'm very much honoured to to join them. Not least, as I know, uh, many of the audience are from Ireland, and the actions of our government, the UK government, have caused um, too many issues in Ireland in recent years. And those of us based in London may be viewed with some suspicion or as an Irish academic said to me recently in the tone probably reserved for a family member guilty of a heinous crime, we're not so much angry as disappointed. It was quite the telling off. Um, now, judging by the comments trade specialists outside the UK make, there's confusion about UK trade policy. I guess that's why I've been invited. Typical themes include whether global Britain is really serious, our government understands the nature of trade barriers erected to our nearest markets, and why our services economy mostly focuses on free trade agreements reducing already low tariffs for goods. So, in brief, before we go into this in more detail, yes, global Britain is serious, no, the government doesn't really understand modern trade, and our desire for free trade agreements, FTAs, is more about the politics of Brexit than the economics of the UK. That said, there aren't easy answers for any country um, in putting together a trade policy, given the complexities of modern global trade, which I'll start with, in fact. Um, but just before that, um, and in terms of the UK's approach, a quick summary of where we are today, arguably somewhere off the coast of Australia. Uh, fresh from agreements with that country and Japan, ready next for New Zealand, then the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, and finally, the big one, the USA. Yep, it's the gap year prior to settling down to real work. It's the, uh, it's the student dream. It doesn't really involve Europe, except for the odd rude remark about how good it is to be away from home, and uh, irritation if dragged into occasional domestic matters. <sighs> such such uh, cynicism should be tempered somewhat, for we, we actually have great trade strengths, some that have government approval, like aircraft engines, Scotch whiskey, the Premier League, and some that don't have much government approval and support, like the BBC and universities. Um, but whatever the government's definition of global trade, it's hardly new for the UK to trade globally. Um, that trade landscape is changing, though, so I'm just going to start with that before then getting to the heart of the matter. Why is the UK doing what we are doing? And what is that? Um, so, you wouldn't know it listening to policymakers in Brussels and Washington, D.C., but we've never benefited so much globally from, from trade. The astonishing response to the COVID crisis, with vaccines developed and produced in their billions in a matter of months, deserves far more credit. The sale of goods and services around the world, the availability of a range of goods at competitive prices, even during such a crisis, something no previous generation had. And it might be as good as it gets for us as well. Um, for the West's response to, frankly, being outgrown by China is barriers to trade. Since the 2008 financial crash, decisions that had major distributional consequences since, um, and even go going back to the technology influence development of trade over the last 30 years, what we're seeing, we see, we've seen fragmented supply chains um, 
mostly regionally, which people haven't really understood. In aggregate, our countries have done fine, but there's been poor distribution. We think there's this popular perception that China has been cheating. Often it has. Sometimes it hasn't. Sometimes we've been cheating just as much. People feel otherwise. People do not feel that trade is benefiting them. Um, coupled with the fact that we are increasingly regulated countries, everything that is traded is regulated, um, and it means that we have these non-tariff barriers that are more easily overcome by larger companies. Um, and now it looks like we'll get even more rules which are anti-trade and anti-China, and the World Trade Organization, officially the, uh, the ultimate uh, governing body for, for global trade, is roughly being sidelined. We've got the low carbon uh, transformation to come, which is going to require quite some reinvention of our economies from cars to power generation. Um, and then we've got we're going to be doing that while taking the cost of extra trade barriers and but Asia potentially lowering trade barriers. So we've got really quite a quite a tough uh, situation going on where we've got misunderstood trade. Uh, we've got China still going strong, although slowing down because of their population growth, and concerns in across the West about the direction of travel. That's really the backdrop for UK trade, for the UK becoming free to trade. It's also the backdrop, frankly, for the Brexit vote. The Brexit vote is one of discontent, as was Trump, as is some of the protectionist language now coming from the EU. There is a, you know, there is logic to this as a whole. Um, so let's look at the UK now in more detail. And I'll start actually with the good news, because there is some good news. Um, with one fairly obvious exception, we are going to be more open than the EU and the US to trade. There is that consensus across the political spectrum. We might also do some industry sub subsidies and protection from inward investment, but we'll probably do less than the EU and the US. And given that on balance, openness means better economic performance, that is a good thing. Now, the obvious exception of the EU is a problem. And what passes for thinking among government trade cheerleaders, being that the EU is so protectionist that it doesn't count, is a reality distortion just too great to be seriously debated. Um, coupled with a government recognising neither the trade world I've been discussing or the usual approach of anchoring trade policy in domestic economic and international relations goals. And that's where we get to confusion. Because we'd normally expect economic policy to drive trade policy, supported by foreign policy that is also concerned with international partnerships and security. But the UK doesn't have an industrial strategy. We don't know what the future of our car industry is looking like, or the our finance sector, or how trade might help that. Yesterday, we had the publication of a Brexit benefits document, which more or less suggested that the answer to everything was cake, then some more cake, um, and then everything was going to be great. And that's obviously not a serious basis for the sort of choices one has to take for a successful economic or trade policy. Now, something about trade that's quite important is increasingly, except for a budget, this is the most broad ranging uh, policy instrument that a government actually has. Trade agreements cover all manner of issues from intellectual property to uh, the services regulations. They cover immigration. It's not just about tariffs. Um, so there's a huge space to fill there. And in the UK, it has to be filled in some way because the Brexit dividend has really honed in on trade as something we can do. We can do our own trade deals has become almost a uh, an object of faith in, in, in Brexit. So in lieu of any more detailed thinking, what that is leading to is we're signing free trade agreements without worrying too much about what's in them. Um, so we see a first deal with Australia um, and one upcoming with New Zealand. Uh, these are termed ambitious. All trade agreements are termed as ambitious for every country. So that's nothing new. But in truth, they're mostly about a little bit of tariff reduction. They're not really about uh, Check, removing regulatory barriers or helping UK services companies much. And the UK is a services superpower. We're the world's second largest services exporter, although our exports have not been increasing so much recently. And there is there are signs that other European countries are catching us up, and that includes Ireland. 
when it comes to removal of tariffs, where are our tariffs? Mostly they're on agriculture. So we're benefiting Australian and New Zealand agricultural exporters at the cost of UK farmers. Now, that might be the right thing to do economically. It looks like the Treasury has decided that that's what it is, that farming is not worthy of support in the UK. But the problem is other departments think that it is. So that will have future implications. Um, so it's trade deals, to some, um, but some more important than others. And the CPTPP and the US are at the top of importance for the UK government. And it's not a clear reason, but there are a bunch of interrelated reasons which aren't really economic as to why these are the most important. For many Brexit enthusiasts, a US trade deal was really what it was all about. That would confirm uncoupling from the EU. Some of this, I think, dates back to the neocon era of the 2000s. A lot of relationships were, were built then between the then conservative opposition and the Republicans who were pushing the US then towards assertive global policy for freedom. Um, there's also, for some, this was about uh, deliberately siding with the US over the EU on issues such as food regulation, such as the infamous chlorinated chicken, helps not uh, at least a little by some generous US funding for uh, people who are saying that. Now, so the US was number one, but some of the people who were pushing for a US trade deal thought that that might be a one step too far in the first instance. So they then thought CPTPP could be a step towards it uh, to sort of um, almost make a US trade deal a fait accompli. Oddly, then there were some others who thought that the UK outside of the EU needed to be anchored in global trade rules and the best way to do that was to join CPTPP and that wasn't just people in the in the UK thinking that that was actually also Japan's view and they have impact given the the iconic nature of our uh, car assembly plant in Sunderland for Nissan so for that combination of reasons CPTPP and US become the number one trade policy priority and we just kind of retrofit our interest to those texts Australia draws heavily on those on those texts in our in our trade deal um, and we don't join other trade deals which might be attractive, such as uh, there's some uh, uh, multi-country agreements being led by New Zealand that focus on climate change or and, and sustainable goods or on the digital economy partnership. But we're not joining those. Um, so that that's where it seems to have led us. But then the US is not currently interested in any trade deals. And we see a couple of extraordinary recent begging speeches by UK ministers to try to encourage them otherwise. Um, and this in turn creates an apologies for this, the odd logic of the desire. We want to diverge from EU food regulations for a US trade deal while denying we want to diverge from EU food regulations um, in, in public discourse. But um, we can't have a veterinary agreement with the EU, um, which would remove many checks under the Northern Ireland Protocol, because maybe we do want to change diverge from EU food regulations. There is actually literally no logic there. You can't make sense of that set of, of, that set of um, contradictions. Um, and UK ministers often talk of the reg opportunities of regulatory divergence and rarely note that trade is eased by alignment. So those flaws are obvious. <laughs> There's a further, very large flaw. That neocon Republican Party of the 2000s is long gone. Um, that's been taken over by, uh, by, by Trump. And actually, without the UK, we're actually seeing probably greater US-EU cooperation because the US has had to strengthen ties into Brussels um, now that London is no longer a pathway uh, in. Um, so that hasn't really worked either. We're not a mass producer of products that attract tariffs. So that's an odd thing to, uh, to base our uh, trade policy around. We're implementing free ports, which we possibly could have done in the EU, but they have limited or frankly no obvious economic benefit so none of this quite adds up it is true that many cptpp countries the likes of new zealand or singapore are probably natural trade allies for the uk they are more likely to be open other countries may join so there are reasons for us to to do that um then again you get out trade deals like with india where negotiations have just started which may well be the latest of many optimistic pronouncements in that direction. Um, there's been so many initiatives between the UK and India, while exports have scarcely been growing at all. So it's almost like there's a whole world of UK trade which is not being understood in terms of any of these activities. 
So we really could be doing much better. And I think one of the ironies of all of this is it is almost like the UK government is putting free trade agreements on a pedestal as the kind of straitjacket which Brexiters continually disparage in terms of EU countries and the euro. So we've we've kind of come out of the EU, we claimed it was a straitjacket, and we're putting ourselves straight into another straitjacket of uh, pursuit of free trade agreements that don't particularly suit us. Now, many I've worked with ministers, many of us will have worked with ministers and know that they want to sign pieces of paper, uh, particularly to show Brexit a success. So you hoped that those pieces of paper would be ones that would uh, deliver some benefits. Um, Neighbours are more important for trade. There is a gravity effect in trade, which means that uh, you know, it is more important to trade. Uh, you know, you should trade more with your with, with local countries. We all have the the West. We all have our idea of Indo-Pacific strategies, and none of us seemingly have a very good idea of what they might be or how they might fit our economies. Um, and just to finish off this this summary. Um, UK claims of being a free trade leader at the, the WTO are scarcely any more credible um, because really no country has ever increased trade barriers by more than the UK did when we left the EU and put in place a very shallow free trade agreement. So that all has implications. We've put a it's a it's a unique experiment. Nobody has put up major barriers to trade in the 21st century uh, before we before we did. Nobody's put so many up. Uh, Trump put a few up to China. Um, we've got more more paperwork, diverging regulations. All reputable economic forecasting suggest, suggested this would lead to a fall in GDP and trade and that that wouldn't be made up for by new trade deals. And that's fortunately for economics. That's exactly what we've seen. Global trade recovered last year from COVID in, in 2020. But in the UK, the recovery was, was slower. Um, trade flows between the UK and the EU are down despite a lot of COVID related trade, such as around vaccine production. So it seems likely that a 15% fall in trade and a 4% hit on our GDP are reasonable. And it isn't just reduced UK EU trade. If major manufacturers decide the inclusion of UK companies in cross European supply chains is not worth the hassle, that could also hit our global exports. Our exporters now face more trade barriers than those in the EU. Um, and quietly, that's one of the reasons why the government is not, in fact, diverging regulations as much as part their, the, the Brexit partisans would, would want. Um, there's already a general loss of competitiveness from reduced competition and reduced inward investment. We can't risk too much here. The UK economy is not collapsing, but it's harder for, for us to compete. Uh, former manufacturing areas, now often known as the Red Wall, they may be the worst affected. Um, now, of course, there's a chance we address our longstanding productivity problems or we discover some great new way of regulating. Though it's hard to believe in a competitive global environment that would stay unique for long. Um, and indeed, future growth pro projections from uh, Independent Office of Budget Responsibility are at 1.4%, which is very low by historic standards. I already mentioned our services exports haven't really been increasing either. So it's not impossible we can survive outside the, the EU, but there's huge challenges to doing so. And that's then we have to think about the international relations as well. It may be very nice for the government to think that their closest international partner is Australia, um, but they put very little effort into maintaining relations with any European country. In fact, former negotiator uh, Lord Frost insulted every EU country as being in effect non-democratic. Then you find you want allies and friends, whether to resolve trade issues or you've got security issues such as Russia. Obviously, there's Northern Ireland. I'm not going into that in great detail in this uh, in this presentation, but you've got the continued sense of a government that thinks that can't believe how wrong the EU and the US can be, but has yet to find anyone else who thinks they're right. Um, and it's clearly damaging our reputation for upholding treaties, casting doubt on our trade understanding, and obviously it's having an effect on uh, on Northern Ireland itself. So that is all um, really uh, really challenging. Um, and it's almost like supporters have become entangled in the idea there's a simple Brexit, whereas actually it means complex choices. And we're not really addressing those. So a lot of worries about which direction we're going. And yet, looking forward, um, we're not coming back to the EU anytime soon. We're, discussion on the customs union or the single market um, 
has been rendered toxic by our politics of the last few years. And I can't imagine the EU would want us in anything either. Um, the Prime Minister being brought down by Partygate wouldn't threaten Brexit. It looks instead like we're going to kind of basically ignore the recent past as too difficult and hope for the best in the future. The Conservatives are likely to remain antagonistic for the to the EU for some time to come. Um, they've not, it's not really spreading through the, uh, the country. Brexit is not deemed to be going well. Um, and so that may mean in years to come, we have closer ties can, can restart. But I think that will take some time. Um, the government will have to deal with the EU. There are day to day problems um, and business realities, um, but they'll do it quietly. There won't be much trust. Uh, with the EU and not much strategy from the UK, and it probably means we won't get very good deals. We haven't got a very good deal um, since 2016, for example, if we look at the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Um, we also haven't actually invoked Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol because that trade war with the EU that would result is not one that's going to benefit the UK. So you see this sort of hostile language coupled with rather with a little bit of pragmatism very quietly under the under the surface and i suspect that will continue for uh, a little bit of time to uh, to come and will only gradually ease there are some other areas where again we've quietly uh, remained within european norms who stayed as members of the european standards framework we'll probably have to make some kind of accommodation with the eu's carbon border adjustment mechanism although the government continues to uh, to deny that uh, that's what will happen Similarly, we'll probably have to stay aligned with data adequacy all the while talking about implementing some much more uh, wonderful uh, set of regulations. We haven't actually yet got around to replacing the uh, CE marking, the conformity, conformity mark on, uh, on products with a UK version. Again, it wouldn't happen in Northern Ireland. It's a, it's a problem for the government as to what to do about that. Um, we're having to be more generous than we planned on the immigration system. That's now split. That's now equal for EU and non-EU citizens. It doesn't, though, quite meet the, the Brexit brochure. Um, and so what you find really is that Brexit was always mostly about the politics. But in a world of multinational companies dominating trade, they have to be attracted to the country. And they're not going to be by the pure politics of Brexit. Um, the promise of Brexit freeing the economy, ultimately, it's the economy is going to temper Brexit. Um, so just quick, briefly to uh, to finish, where should we be going? Uh, we spend so much time discussing the failings of the UK um, and less time thinking, well, what would actually a UK first trade policy look like? Well, you start with 50 percent of our trade with the EU and 50 percent isn't. So it's going to be a balance. Where there are benefits to the UK doing things differently, take them. Where it's better to align, do that. So in manufacturing, there's little benefit to going our own way on regulations, which are global norms, whether that's chemicals, aircraft, cars. Just align as best we can with the EU. Have that veterinary agreement. It would really help in the, uh, in the Northern Ireland Protocol. We want to be part of European supply chains. When it comes to services, yeah, maybe less so. Um, we don't necessarily want to be automatically following EU rules in financial services. We'll want regulatory stability. We'll want data adequacy. But we're a player in our own right. We're possibly a, a bigger player than the EU in terms of financial services regulation. So we might be able to take, take advantage. Um, we certainly need to be build, rebuilding our business relations and getting more inward investment. Um, we need more deals on regulatory alignment and on, on, on services. Those parts of modern trade that are so important, we need, um, for example, our performers to be able to easily uh, tour around Europe. That's an issue that's come up uh, quite a bit. We need a generally friendlier approach to the world in which we seek to be more facilitator than leader um, when it comes to global trade. We're not going to be a leader, but we can help a role we often played at the EU as well, facilitating better outcomes. And as important as this, because it's business that trades, not government, is recognise and celebrate our strengths and national champions, whether that is the, the BBC, universities, aviation, defence, pharmaceuticals. We actually do have um, a large number of success stories, even if they're not likely to be the mass employers of previous times. And we should probably also 
increase the value we put to those parts of the economy that support global trade, such as logistics and infrastructure. We should probably embrace the low carbon trans transformation and also try to find a new way, a little bit more open than the EU, towards the challenges of modern trade, such as development or, or animal welfare, where we can and should mix openness with more um, with 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 uh, greater rules um, so that trade is, is, is fairer trade as well. Um, now, nothing is going to guarantee success in the complex world of, of, of modern trade. And uh, this is not the subject of today, but I think we're, we're seeing the return of inflation as well. This is going to be a, a tough few years ahead. There's going to be no easy answers. Um, and, you know, we see the cheap lure of um, deregulators or protectionists and then we see the 21st century trade. And I think that's what a lot of what is going to be about. Um, yeah, we are, we've got some strengths. We've got a lot of weaknesses as well. Our GDP is not what it should be. We're, uh, we're almost certainly lower than, uh, lower than Ireland, even when you exclude certain accounting uh, transactions. But we could, be, we could be doing a lot better. But we need a real, much greater focus on those things that we're good at. Um, and, in, you know, of thinking of, modern supply chains not of selling biscuits around the world so ultimately it doesn't make sense right now because there's really no uk economic foreign or trade policy um and we can't really be coherent because the government doesn't really have a coherent view view of the world so we're kind of waiting we're in a holding pattern um we're going to be slow to find a lasting approach to uh, to, to trade um, but at the end of the day, we're not going to fail completely because we've got a lot of strengths as well. So that's where I'm going to, to leave it. That covers a lot of ground in a short space of time. A lot of it probably not quite satisfactorily. So uh, I'll look forward to uh, thoughts and questions.